showcase the opportunities they have available, help them understand. So the question is, what do you talk about, right? So the first speaker, she went up, and what do you think she talked about? Uh, <laughs> herself. She talked about herself. She talked about, and I kid you not, that she has 17 PhDs and 22 master's degrees. Okay, she said she's never worked a day in her life. She's constantly going to school. So she's probably in her late 50s and 60s, or early 60s at this point. But she's talking about her experience and how she has all these degrees and how she likes to travel and all, all these things. Things that the, these people that, you know, your audience can't actually relate to. Second person goes up and she talks about going to grad school at Cornell, right? She's talking about her thesis and her defense. She's talking about her dog and how she's going to graduate soon and what she's going to do with her dog. Again, is this going to resonate with her audience? Right? They, they can't even think of grad school at this point. They're wondering about college if it's even right for them. So I get up. What do you think I talk about? Wow, give me some credit. <laughs> AI. <laughs> Not the scope. <laughs> I talk about the opportunities that they have, right? I talk about the value they could get out of college. I put, I try to make them think about themselves, make themselves imagine what it'd be like to be in college, the experiences that they would get, the experiences I got, the experiences that they would get, the benefits they could create for them and their families. Very different, right? When we're all done, who do you think got mobbed by all the students and parents afterwards? I did, yeah. I mean, it's only this much because of it. But worth it, right? That's that's the whole key thing. Design thinking, when I create something amazing, something that people will use, care about, value, you got to think about what their needs are, what their experiences are. And this is really core for AI because no two AI solutions are quite the same. As we saw last week, there's a lot of personalization when it comes to AI. And so experience plays a huge role. So the question becomes then, okay, I get the design thinking, let's take a step back, how do we even come up with a good idea? And in the real world, most organizations lock themselves up in a conference room with no windows, a whiteboard, and it's brainstorm ideas. And I don't know many good ideas that actually come out that way. It's not really conducive to you know, thoughts, it's not really conducive to thinking about experience and what we're trying to accomplish. I see the best ideas come out from design thinking, where we look at what's the business, what's our vi what's the viability, what's the experience the innovation we want to create, the people, what is it they desire, what is it that they value, the technology, what's actually feasible for us to create. It's this small intersection here where the real opportunities actually lie. So it's a lot of work to get here. But this is what design thinking really is. It's understand, explore, prototype, evaluate. So we're trying to understand our customers, explore possibilities where some things we think are going to create value. Rather than just build something, let's try something. Let's try something small and see how well it works, get some feedback, build upon what works, what's not doesn't work in, what people don't like, we'll change, modify get feedback, evaluate, and then repeat the cycle again. And keep going until we actually have something special. To see how that actually works, I'm going to play you a little video. In a world connected by smartphones, GPS, and social media, we have come to expect businesses, hospitals, and governments to deliver personalized experiences to us on any device in real time. And while we still go to the store to buy groceries or get on a plane to travel from point A to point B, the way we consume goods and services is fundamentally changing, which also means the way companies design and build these experiences must evolve to keep pace. 
true approach is to help our design thinking and agile development. But the principles they are based on can be a great asset to anyone trying to solve a problem or find better ways of getting work done. Design thinking is a method for practical and creative problem solving that evolved from fields as varied as engineering, architecture, and business. At its core, design thinking focuses on understanding people's needs and creatively discovering the best solution to meet those needs. Its core concepts are understand, explore, prototype, and evaluate. Agile is a group of software development methods that emerge to quickly, iteratively, and collaboratively build better business solutions. Its core concepts are iterative development, risk management, and transparency. Based on work with thousands of our clients, IBM is expanding upon traditional design thinking. We call this IBM design thinking, and it aims particularly at meeting the complex needs of large-scale enterprises without sacrificing the personal focus of design thinking. To get a better idea of how these new ways of working, IBM Design Thinking and Agile, come to life, let's take a look at how a company benefits from using these approaches in expanding their business. Green Jeans Nursery is a successful garden design and supply store based out of the state of Vermont in the United States. They've had such explosive growth over the past two years that they've been able to open three additional stores. They launched their web experience about a year ago. But while their in-store sales continue to grow, their website sales haven't met expectations. Gene, the founder and owner, uses IBM design thinking and knows that he needs to start with the end user. What exactly are the reasons their needs are not being met? First, he needs to find out who his real users are, what they think, how they feel, what they see, hear, say, and do. Not satisfied with merely coming up with potential issues internally, the business, design, and engineering team members collaborate and decide to find people that have a shared interest in gardening and are familiar with the products. After their initial search, the team narrows their focus to a candidate that meets a wide variety of helpful criteria, Jane. Jane agrees to an ongoing relationship to provide priceless insights as the business grows. As the team begins to work with Jane, they gain insights they otherwise would have missed. This research is crucial in making improvements for their users. For example, they find that Jane, despite being interested in new plants, doesn't know where to begin. She likes the way many plants look online, but she doesn't know how to grow and take care for them. At the store, a customer can always ask an expert, but visitors to the website like Jane have no simple way to get help. Armed with this new information, the team regroups with the larger team to plan next steps for refining the challenge or hill statement. They agree the site fails to deliver personalized how-to guidance at any point in the online experience. To articulate a clear outcome statement, the team generates as many ideas as they can. Help chat, a planting guide tool, the ability to submit photos and questions. Gradually, they weed out unrealistic and expected ideas that lack a wow factor. Then, and only then, they start to determine how they will build a solution with new features like responsive recommendations to expert videos based on what content a user is viewing. They begin with sketches, then move to more formal designs to better hone in on the real value their users need. The team leader engages a larger cross-functional team that can deliver a working model of the idea. The working model will be reviewed with the larger team and tested with end users. As the team is developing the prototype, they refine the idea further to offer Jane the ability to archive favorite video materials. They take the working prototype back to the larger team and to the end user to test its effectiveness and get feedback. The team will iteratively refine the product at each step of the way to make it suited to the user and more seamlessly integrated with the existing website. Finally, the team deploys the new interactive gardening guidance tool, which is closely monitored to ensure it can undergo continuous upgrades based on insights from usage metrics and new customer needs. By using IBM Design Thinking and Agile, Green Jeans Nursery is able to define and solve their client challenge by putting the end user first. By applying Agile development methods, they are able to deliver new functionality using an iterative approach that was transparent and minimized risk. But the underlying principles of Agile and IBM design thinking have the potential for more far-reaching applications for all of us, whether we are developers, event managers, client-facing IBMers, or simply collaborating on projects across global teams. If you are trying to improve a process, beginning with the end user will help you focus on improvements that provide the most value. If you are trying to make progress quickly on a project, establish the most critical features to focus on first, iterate quickly, and share progress regularly across the team, 
and with end users. As the marketplace changes, we need to evolve faster than ever. It's how we keep reinventing ourselves every day. Stephen Colbert swears by it. But that was a couple of guys, again, thinking about the experience, understanding the need, exploring different options. Right? How many different types of bacon are there? Two, four. Two, four. What kind of bacon do we have? Turkey bacon. Turkey bacon. Chicken bacon. Chicken bacon. Chicken bacon. Chicken bacon. Pork bacon, beef bacon, lamb bacon, deer bacon, pretty much any meat you can turn into bacon. <laughs> Except fish. <laughs> so, you guys have heard of impossible meat? Yes. Beyond meat? Similar approach these guys took with the bacon and the mayonnaise. Incredibly enough, I wonder how they do this, but there's actually vegan cookies. Yep. Yeah. Right? Don't know how you do that without butter or some sort of coagulant, but hey, I am not a chemist. <laughs> but this is this is what we have to think about, right? These are the opportunities design thinking actually gives us to explore these types of things. And if you want to be a good designer, you don't try and search for a solution until you've determined what the real problem is. Right? And even then, solving that problem, you have to stop and consider a whole range of potential solutions. Then we converge upon one of them. This is the challenge that we have. We often go out and we know there's a problem, but we don't fully understand the problem. We just try to come up with a solution. And we come up with one solution rather than a whole bunch of solutions. So in the vacant A's case, right, they really understand what's the real problem. Some people can't 
have bacon. They can't have mayonnaise, even though most people like the taste. So what's the solution? They didn't come up with just one thing. They came up with a whole bunch of different things. Right? And they finally realized that baconese was the most optimal solution among that. And that's what smart business people, smart technologists do. They apply this type of thought process. So let's take a look at what some of these people have done. Right? Think about robots. Right here, who, who would love to have a robot? Does anybody actually have a robot? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> How do you design a robot? What's the right design for a robot? Do you design something that kind of looks human? Do you look something that has a human appearance? Do you have something that looks kind of futuristic? Something that might look like a little like a child? What's the right thing to do here? Yeah, we have to think about what the user wants, right? Are all you gonna want the same type of robot? No. no. Right, of these four robots, these are your only four choices. How many people want this type of robot? A couple of people, how about this one? More, how about this one? You really like this one? How about this one? Good to die between these two. Has anyone ever actually seen a pepper, by the way? Yeah. Where'd you see it? <laughs> Cemetery. <laughs> there's, a, there's actually a pepper that splits its time between Fashion Island and the Irvine Spectrum. The Irvine company uses it as a concierge, but only in the daytime. Only in the daytime. If you go to the Smithsonian, Smithsonian has 50 peppers in their museums, giving uh, advice directions. If you ever go to Japan, you'll actually see a pepper or something like this, so that you need directions, you can find the train, or it's time to buy train tickets, they can actually tell you. And if you see pepper at the Spectrum or Fashion Island, ask it for a selfie. It's hilarious. <laughs> but even when it comes to robots, we have Again, we have different experiences that we might want to create, right? If we want a, a robot that looks very human-like, who do you think we're trying to target? What kind of experience are we trying to give that group? Uh, <laughs> relationships, so expand on that. <laughs> okay, they, they can take this in the wrong direction. <laughs> The people that probably want this type of experience want something that they can relate to better, right? That they feel like they're talking with a person. And that's actually something we're seeing more and more people want. They, they don't like the robotic look. They want the robots to look more human. Right? They want to make it feel like it's more of a natural conversation. How about this one? So, I mean, it doesn't quite look like, you know, a person, but it's got the appearance, like the body of a human. What could this robot do that this robot can't do? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Actually, Pepper can shake hands. She also high five and fist bump. <laughs> so yeah, this robot can probably climb stairs. It probably has better motion. Can move around easier, right? The pepper is on wheels, so it's not going to be able to go anywhere. This robot can probably sit, right? So if you want more traditional, like if you're going to have a meeting, they want the robot there to record notes or something like this one, probably going to work better. How about this one? Who do you think wants this one? Not scary. Not scary? <laughs> Put a little Freddy Krueger face on there. Okay, so it might be more of a manufacturing or production type of robot. We know what Pepper, she often uses a concierge. Kids find Pepper very friendly, 
right? It's just a little more childlike. We get different experiences, so that's why we come up with different robots. So has anyone heard of a company called SoftBank? So SoftBank is not a bank, it's actually one of the world's largest telecom companies. But they do, they're a Japanese company, they do a lot of different businesses. And they have a robotic division called Aldebaran Systems. So when you look at the robots, they have 12 versions of a robot. Pepper is one of them. They have something called Nano that's about this big, but it looks very humanoid. They also have, I don't know why, a 30-foot tall robot. It also looks very human-like, kind of looks like this. Don't know why it needs to be 30 feet. But again, you can see the different things that we have out there. So now you're all thinking like, I want to get started with design thinking, right? Uh, here you go. Here are your steps. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> well, let's simplify it a bit, right? Unless you got it. So test next time, right? <laughs> so design thinking actually started in the 1960s, a whole century ago. And it was basically defined on trying to solve problems, the problems that could be stated by users. And it's all about looking at it from the user's perspective. <clears throat> so it was actually grounded in empathy, prototyping, and collaboration, not the typical ways that we tend to build products. Right? We have to actually relate and understand what people need rather than tell them what they want. And so we go through the four steps, as I mentioned, and as we saw in the video, understand, explore, prototype, evaluate. Understand, we have to understand what the problems and developing empathy with the users. So I believe last time I talked about Disneyland, right? I, I talked about Galaxy's Edge, the new Star Wars area. How many people have been there? Wow, that's a lot more people. You guys like the experience? Yeah. So let's set aside Galaxy's Edge for a second, but let's just think about Disneyland in general. How many people have been to Disneyland? Do you guys like going to Disneyland? Yes. Would you like to go to Disneyland right now? Yes. <laughs> What's something you don't like about Disneyland? What's the problem you have with Disneyland? Lines. Walking, expensive. expensive, not enough bathrooms, right? So there's definitely some problems here. There's some needs, right? Can we do anything about lines? Can we do anything about the cost? So we can explore concepts here. What are, what are some things we might be able to do tackling these issues. Let's think about the line, for example. How long have you guys waited in line before? Two hours. Two hours, four hours, six hours, six, six hours? What ride was that? So let's, let's brainstorm a bit. What can we do to make the line situation more tolerable? Okay, so they have an app. What can you do on the app? You can check the wait time, you can actually get a fast pass through the app. Anything else? Okay, you can do that. Let's think a little more out of the box here, right? So these are, what are some things you think would help pass the time in the line? Entertainment, right? We all want to be entertained. How can we get entertained? Oh. Robots talking to us. Excellent. That's actually, yeah. Maybe one thing with costumes, like in the line, it actually costumes. Maybe even in the street, like the park. All right, so robots, the, the, they call them, uh, I can't remember the name, the, the Disney, I don't forget what they call their employees, but the people that dress up as some of the characters, right? Cast members. Cast members, thank you. So there's things we know we can do here, right? If you go to Galaxy's Edge, 
they've done something different, right? They explored some concepts here. They're using AI. Do you guys ever remember what they're doing with AI? So that's, that's something, but if we're talking about just being in line right now, can we do? I heard someone said like animatronics, right? You can actually have conversations, a lot of personalized conversations. If you have, if it recognizes your face, it knows you've been there before. And if you have the app, it actually knows who you are. And so you can actually have a personalized conversation for you. You can also earn credits doing various things in the area. And so as you're standing in line, you can try to earn more credits, or you can spend your credits on stuff. They should get real stuff. You can also see who has a bounty on them, and then create a lot more interactivity like right that, right? So they didn't just roll all this stuff out, they prototyped it. So after exploring some concepts and see what they could do, they actually piloted it out in a few different areas, a few different theme parks to see what was working well. They evaluated it, stuff that worked well, they kept, they kept building, things that don't work well, they shut the side, tried some new things. That's Disney using AI for design thinking. They're trying to design thinking for AI in Galaxy's Edge. Pretty cool? Yeah. Question? Uh, I actually like something that they could make Disney more like maybe there could be more like Robots, like so, there's some more employees and help you with these things. Fits the idea at the Disney. <laughs> 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 Would you like your little droid concierge to go around with you at Disneyland? Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Probably gonna happen one day soon. But again, this is, we're thinking about the experience. We hate the lines, right? We don't want to stand in line, we need something to do, right? But there's not a whole lot we can do to make the lines go faster because so many people want to ride the rides. But we can make the experience of waiting in line a lot more pleasant, get to entertain people. So it's a good way to actually apply design thinking. So to do this right, right, we have to also think about our hill, so we want to focus on the outcomes. Disneyland, our, what are our outcomes? We want to keep people entertained while they're waiting in line. We don't want them to feel frustrated, right? It's the happiest place on earth. We want to envision the experience, so we want to work with users or power users to figure out things that might create that value for them, give them something that they actually need, and we want to align the team, so we do what we call playback. So we make sure the team understands what the needs are, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we can try and do that. So we have people talk back the collaboration aspect. All this stuff is really important when it comes to AI solutions. Because if the AI is, it thinks like a person, it learns things. If it learns the wrong things, what happens? Right? You guys remember Taybot? Taybot, Microsoft two years ago released an AI bot on Twitter. How many people actually use Twitter? Oh, quite a few of you. I'm impressed. It's better than my MBA students. <laughs> so they trained K, their AI, up the level of a teenage girl, like a 13 year old girl. And the idea was to have this grand social experiment where you would interact with people, would learn, would grow, and develop, right? Tay's very first tweet was, hello world, I can't wait to engage with you. 24 hours later, Microsoft shut Taybot down because it was racist, sexist, and a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, a small group of people thought it was a great opportunity to corrupt the AI. And so they actually taught it these things. So Tavon was actually saying misogynic things, he was saying racist things, he was espousing the virtues of Hitler. Right? Again, problems not focused on the outcomes, not envisioning the experience. Microsoft 
did not do a good job there, right? It was a small group of people who doesn't take much to corrupt an AI when it's learning. And that's why we have to be so critical. That's why design thinking is so important. Right? I don't know what's worse, that that happened or that is a reflection of our society and what we did. So you cannot think your way into a new way of acting. You have to act your way into a new way of thinking. Exactly. <laughs> right? Because AI is so different, right? It's the third generation of computing sparking the fourth industrial revolution and society 5.0. And ethics 2.0, there's a lot of numbers associated everywhere. It's not that we have to kind of go, we have to actually think in a different way. Right? And that's why design thinking is really starting to catch fire because it's like the perfect method to use to not just think of, but actually create, to build AI tools, AI solutions. So if I like art and qualitative inquiry, design thinking can be viewed much less than something that you do, but rather a way of positioning oneself relative to the topic of interest. So design thinking is more than just a method, it's really a stance. It's the way you're going to perceive the world. It's a way to look through and see things through your user's eyes. That's not an easy thing to do. How many of you think you're actually good at understanding other people's perspectives? You guys are excellent. Why does your mom yell at you? Uh, I don't know. I didn't do anything. Right? Right? Your mom or your dad, when they come home, how do they feel? They feel tired. Why do they feel tired? Because they had to work. What's work like? It's tiring? Why? Yeah, you have to give people work. You know, Americans actually work the most of any country in the world. The average American works 54 hours a week. So just start doing the math. Five to six days. It's a lot of hours, right? They get up early. They get, help you guys get ready for school. They take you, take you to school. They make you breakfast. They make you lunch, too. They have all their work stuff they got to take care of. They race back to pick you up or meet you. Maybe they make dinner or take you out, right? It's really long days. Think about how you feel when you're tired, when you've had a really rough day at school, right? What's your mood like? Bad? Maybe a little cranky, right? Are you easily irritated? So, do you think your parents feel that way when they get home from work? Do you consider that when you don't do anything, <laughs> right? We're not, most of us are not good at actually understanding other people's perspectives. People who are do extremely well in life. Right? I mean, they can do design thinking, but they can actually build better relationships. They can actually perceive things in a new way. Right? Think of it this way. Bacon eggs. Right? Why was that so important? Why was that such a great invention in the United States? What was their, their different position? What was their different perspective? How can people that are, have dietary or religious restrictions enjoy some of these foods or some of these flavors? How can we make that happen? Right? It's real easy to complain about problems. It's a lot harder to do something about it. Let's consider the movie camera. How, does anyone actually know how the movie camera was invented? It started with a bet. So a guy came and saw this uh, French scientist, Lafont. And the guy told him, I've made a bet that when a horse runs, right, when it gallops along, it can have all four hoofs off the ground. The other guy says, no, one hoof always has to be on the ground. So he goes, he tells Lafont, can you help me with my bet? So Lafont thinks about it and says, okay. 
They go out to a field and they set up a hundred cameras. And it's set up in such a way that as a horse gallops by, each camera goes up in a second. Right? So they're basically taking 100 pictures of the horse as it gallops by. So they have their stack of photos and they're going through it. The guy that made the bet is just looking at the photos and finds one with all four hooks off the ground. He's like, yes, I win the bet. I'm going to put my money off. The font is looking at the pictures. He starts like flipping through it and says, you know, when I look at this, it looks like the horse is actually running. Invents the movie camera. How is it that two guys trying to accomplish the same goal come up with such different outcomes? It's a different way of thinking, right? It's a different position. The guy that made the bet, what does he care about? He cares about winning the bet. And so what is he focused on? Finding that one photo that helps him win the bet, right? So he's just thinking of each photo as an individual item. What is LaFont thinking? Yeah, he's looking at it as an aggregate, right? He's not trying to win a bet. He's just like, this is really interesting because I'm taking all these sequence of photos, I'm flipping through it, it's like I'm watching the horse actually run. It's like I've created motion from a set of still images. Different position, different perspective. And that's the movie camera. Who do you think got the buyer end of the deal on that one? The font, right? Think about fireworks. How many of you guys enjoy fireworks? Who invented fireworks? The Chinese, right? When Marco Polo made his trek to China, he saw fireworks. What did Marco Polo see? Weapon. Right? He saw a weapon. The Chinese thought they had just created a cool entertainment tool. tool. I, Marco Polo saw a weapon, right? Different perspective. This is the power that design thinking gives us. And this, we can do it for good, we can do it for evil, unfortunately. But the key here is we have to diverge, right? We have to kind of set aside how we normally think about things and try and think of different things. Try and do a lot of brainstorming, think out of the box, green screen, blue sky, whatever you want to call it. And it's the one thing we have to do with AI in particular. We have to think really different, remember? So you have different capabilities. Once we've done that, we kind of start having to remix our ideas back to what's feasible, what creates value, and actually converge on a solution. We generate a whole bunch of options, look at what makes the most sense to converge back on the one. All right? So what can we do with this? Right, so you remember machines think differently? You remember this slide? Yeah. You sure? Are you sure I actually used this slide last time? Yeah. All right. That's what we have to do when it comes to machines driving, right? We first built them to rely on camera data because that's how we drive. We're not thinking about the capabilities the AI actually has. Just because we can't drive using LiDAR doesn't mean machine, machine can't do it. And after that Tesla accident, thanks Harry Potter, we uh, had to actually go back and explore. We actually had to say, start diverging and say, what are the different ways something can drive? Well, we can use radar, LiDAR, we can use auditory, we can use sensor data, we can have things transmit like transponders, and then converge back onto what works. And you see a remix of ideas right here. So let's run with that for a second. How would this work if we want to use artificial intelligence in travel? How would we apply design thinking here? How many of you guys have ever been on a vacation? The only example that people are familiar with. As a user, as a person that's gone on vacation, 
what are the things that matter to you? What's the experience that you're looking for? Relaxation, fun, entertaining. So how can we use AI to facilitate these goals? How can we uh, help AI do something in travel to enhance your experience or improve your, the odds of you having a nice, peaceful, fun, tranquil, or exciting thrill ride vacation that you might want? Okay? That's a great idea. There's a company like, called Wayblazer that's actually done something like that. Wayblazer is essentially like a travel agency, but it's powered by AI, and it'll ask, it'll ask you questions. Right, you don't have to tell where you want to go. It's just, uh, I'm going well on vacation. Well, like, who are you going to go on vacation with? I'm going to go with my family. I'm going to go with my friends. Like, how many people? How much money are you looking to spend? Right? Who are these people? And based on what it knows about you on these things, they'll we'll try and design an itinerary that you think you'll like the most, or your, your party will like the most. You should stay in one of these three hotels. You should take one of these four tours. You should do this kayaking or sailing experience, whatever it might be. So it's trying to help you create that personalized vacation, but it's based on, again, your experience. What else could you do with AI and travel? Okay, so it could be your tour guide, right? So if you want to personalize, you want a great experience, it's like I want to go through the Louvre and read a bunch of long texting and all these things. I want to spend three days right around the museum either. I just want to see certain things. You could have an AI help you, right? Those are your problems. Like, I would want to spend five hours at the Louvre. What should I see? What are the cool things to learn? Maybe AI can help you with that. Any other ideas with travel? Emergency. Sorry, what? Emergency. Okay. So maybe there's a medical emergency, you get injured or something like that, you have a little AI buddy, right? Or maybe the AI helps, this AI helps you understand the risk factors of where you're going. Say like, you know what, you need a yellow fever shot, or you shouldn't drink the water because it's not, it's not safe. Ah, good one. Yes. How many people are multilingual? Yeah, that's awesome. If you can speak Spanish, Mandarin, and English, you speak eighty percent of the world. How many people? How many people got those three covered? <laughs> Spanish, Mandarin, and English. <laughs> So if you go to if you go to Turkey, what language do most people speak? Turkey. Turkish. Turkish. Not many people speak English, right? I mean, and there are actually AI translation tools that will even do voice to voice for you, so help you overcome some of those barriers. Maybe that actually also opens up that you can now go to places you never thought you'd go before because you don't know the language. Anything else you might be able to do with AI and travel? Do you think in the future you're going to take vacations by hopping in a plane, staying in a hotel, traveling around, riding buses for hours at a time? Yeah? yeah. yeah? No. Yeah. no? If you're not doing that, how are you going to take a vacation? I wish. I wish that was close. How about a VR vacation? Oh, yeah. Ooh, I never thought about that. Oh, yeah. Has anyone heard of an airline called All the Pond Airways? ANA. ANA, yeah. They're Japan's actually biggest airline. And four years ago, they actually started building VR vacation packages powered by artificial intelligence. Right? 
Because this is an airline doing this. They realize that in the future, people are not going to be flying as much. There's not going to be a need. So how do we how do we kind of balance our business out with that? And they said, if we can't, we're not flying to a destination. What if we create the destination for them? And so they're actually creating very amazing, experience-driven VR vacations for people with a little AI or a set of AIs in the VR you can interact with, ask questions, give your concierge, your tour guide, whatever you might need. Add, you know, answer questions for you, point things out to you. So if you want to go to Machu, Machu Picchu, you don't actually physically have to go there anymore. Right? If you want to go to Antarctica, which is incredibly difficult to get to, right? it takes seven days just to get there. Now you don't have to do that. You do that from your living room. Right? Design thinking. How many people want to spend seven days traveling to start their vacation? You still have to make up all the school time. <laughs> right? Most people don't want to spend seven days traveling to a location. How many people want to spend $50,000 to have a dream vacation? What if you have your dream vacation and spend five hundred? What's better? So this is how we can use design thinking in travel. Food. You guys like food? Yeah. Other than Taco Bell? How do we use artificial intelligence in food? Right? What what are just think of our experience, right? What are, the, what are our needs when it comes to food? What are our problems when it comes to food? Taste. Taste. Is it healthy? Where are you going to spend your process? I don't want to spend four hours making a baked Alaska, right? What can we do with AI? How can we apply some design thinking here to come up with some AI solutions? Get you, you can get your recipes, right? The AI might probably help us figure out ingredient substitutes or new ingredient combinations that are either make it healthier, subscribe to our dietary or risk restrictions, or may take less time to cook, right? What else could AI do for us? Okay, can plan out our meals. Maybe you can go out and actually order the ingredients that we're going to need. So we actually have them available. Can it cook? Yes, no, maybe, it depends. That definitely covers the spectrum. How many people think AI can cook? Yes. How many people think AI can cook? Can't. How many people think AI can only cook in virtual reality? So there are actually some AI chefs. You won't find them in the United States, you'll find them in South Korea and Japan. They can make some limited number of dishes. I'm sure that will change in the future. But you guys might want to think, but we're talking about what kind of robot you might want. You might want to factor that as your experience if you want a robot chef. Right? Robot chefs definitely going to have to have arms and probably fingers to grasp tools like knives or right? Yeah. Isn't that like that? Like, and all the, the chefs are going to be the jobs. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Isn't that like that? Not all the, the regular chefs are going to lose their jobs? Well, that's a good question. Will we not have human chefs in the future? I think we'll have less chefs, but I think there's always going to be people experimenting and trying new things. There will always be a need for chefs, human chefs. And some things are probably too complicated for uh, AI to make, at least right now. Uh, I don't know. I mean, do you guys worry about a blender contaminating your food? Your fork, your knife? You know? We could also have the robots wear gloves. Or we could make the robots hands out of porcelain. Right? You don't have to make it out of metal. But again, these. You bring up a really good point, though. This is a good example of design thinking. If we think about the experience and the things we're trying to do, see how that influences how we build a robot? 
right? We know it needs hands, but maybe we shouldn't be using metal hands, maybe it's porcelain hands. Maybe should These are how things actually factor in. <coughs> Pretty cool stuff? Yes, yes. Does anybody recognize this robot? How about this one? Which which robot do you think will sell better? <laughs> Depends on the experience, right? <laughs> if you're gonna sell robots for home use, right, help you do the laundry and cook for you, which robot are you gonna get? <laughs> and if you want a robot to go fight your battles for you. Stop that guy and take your milk money. <laughs> right? Design thinking. Just think of the differences, right? So different uses here. How does that influence how they got built? Who do you think has a, a sturdier set of metals and design? Terminator. Terminator, right? Which one do you think has a better vocabulary? Right? Which one interacts with humans more? Terminator. Wait. Terminator? Wait. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, right? How many languages does C3PO know? All of them. Over 3,000, I believe. It's, uh... Which one do you want to tuck you in at night? <laughs> Right? Even in movies, right? Has everyone watched the movie? No. Even in movies, Jack. they have to apply design thinking. Right? They think about the experience they're trying to create. Right? When George Lucas created C-3PO, what did he, how do you want people to feel about C-3PO? Nice robot. Nice robot, friendly, not scary, right? Right? George Lucas definitely didn't want kids to be frightened of robots. That's why he designed C-3PO and R2-D2 as he did. How about uh, James Cameron? Right? When he designed the Terminator robot, what was he thinking? Deadly. Scary, deadly, right? Why does he want you to feel afraid of this robot? Because they kill people, right? Think of every movie you've watched. There's some element of design thinking involved there. Almost everything you see in the movie, even the background of the props, are designed to evoke some sort of emotion or response from you to create a fuller picture of that experience. Did any of you think of a movie you ever watched where it was just so visually appealing, it was so visually incredible? Speed Racer. Speed Racer. Inception. Avatar. Right? Interstellar. Uh, all these what we consider just minor details in the movies are actually a reflection. They're all they're all using design thinking because they're all thinking about the experience. Every scene, every frame, oh what gets evoked. Right? What's your experience going to be like? Bad movies, they don't do such a great job of design thinking. So has anyone actually seen the movie Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer? It's a book. Start off as a book. If you watch the movie, it was, it was panned. The movie is actually hilarious. It really is. But it wasn't meant to be a comedy. It was a horror drama movie. But it's a much better comedy. So bad design thinking on their part. All right. With that, any questions, guys? Yeah. Can I talk about AI for good? No, I don't. Can you make an AI forget? Okay, make an AI forget. Um, I have not seen that happen. They have, I think, memories. So when I was working on IBM Watson, we gave, we, we gave Watson the Urban Dictionary to read. And that was a mistake. Because Watson basically learned how to curse from it. And then we couldn't get it to stop cursing. <laughs> So think about trying to tell a three-year-old child when it's appropriate to curse and not to curse. It's, it's, it's too complex for a machine to get. 
So we actually had to shut that version down and go back to an old version of Watson because we couldn't just erase it. So that's why it's so important when you teach an AI something, you gotta make sure you're teaching it right because if you make a mistake, it's really hard to make it to unlearn. You can't really unlearn. All you can do is go to a backup copy. Does that answer your question? When there's like a faulty robot or like um, kind of like the example you just brought up, where it like learns something wrong, do you guys just like discard it or how, what do you do with it? You just like take the parts and like make a new one? I mean, you, you can. It's, it depends on what people want to do. Some people might shut it down and repurpose it. You know, just like Star Wars, you can mind wipe a droid. Right? You can erase its entire memory and everything and reprogram it. It just depends on what you want to do. So you can totally junk it and scrap it. Nothing, I mean, nothing lasts forever, especially when it comes to machines. So that's a, a very big fear, a very big justifiable concern. That's why security is so important. That's why there's also a cybersecurity track for you guys. But I don't know if you guys have seen it. You guys use YouTube, right? Yeah. You should check up on YouTube. You can actually see these guys that they've, they've been able to hack into self-driving cars through their iPad and actually control the car, lock people inside, have it go around. That's why as you build all these solutions, you're not just building the experience, you're not just filling the need. You have to think about security, about performance. You have to think about how people might misuse the technology. Right? Think about like drones, for example. Anybody have a drone? Is it cool if a drone's flying around your neighborhood? Is it cool if the drone is following you around your neighborhood? Is it cool if the drone is following you around taking pictures of you through your neighborhood? Right? When people put drones and cameras, they didn't think of some of these scenarios. Right? That's why we have to be proactive thinkers. Um, if like in the future, if like a robot were to sort of commit a crime or like hurt someone or injure someone, who would be responsible for it? Or because like someone has to be responsible for it. So who would it be? Would it be like the owner of the company who produced the robot, or would it be like who would be responsible for it? That's what people are actually trying to figure out. We call that liability, right? Is that the person that owns the machine? Is that the person that created the machine? The person that trained the machine? Is it the software architect guys? Is it the data scientists? They don't know yet, right? No good in throwing a robot in jail, right? But that's actually something that I work with in the UN is who has that liability. Right now, we don't know. Put our hands over here. No? Any other questions? Uh, that's a great question. Will robots have rights? That's another hotly debated thing, but I don't remember if I shared this with you guys or not, but last year, Saudi Arabia granted Sophia citizenship. So Sophia is a robot who looks very human and acts like a human, but they gave the robot citizenship. So in Saudi Arabia, Sophia is considered a person. If, or I guess she has a passport, a Saudi Arabian passport, and that's opened up a can of worms. That doesn't mean Sophia deserves to be compensated. Is it entitled to basic rights like health care? In Saudi Arabia, I guess. Any other questions? These are the big questions that have to be tackled and you guys will be thinking about and trying to figure out the answers to the not too distant future. No other questions, I guess. Okay, everybody, let's thank Mr. Sohona for such a great